Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. The spatiotemporal organization, dynamics, and function of virus replication centers during marine polyomavirus infection. I'm Alexis Krauss of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labberts and sponsored by Andor. For more information about our sponsor, please visit their website at andor.com. Now, let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I'd like to now introduce our presenters, Dr. Doug Peters, Postdoctoral Research Assistant, BioFrontiers Institute at the University of Colorado Boulder, and Dr. Alan Mullen, Product Specialist for Microscopy Cameras at Andor Technology. For a complete biography on both of our presenters, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Peters, you may now begin your presentation. Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, and thank you to Andor for giving me an opportunity to do this. My name is Doug Peters. I'm a postdoctoral associate in Robert Garcia's lab at the University of Colorado Boulder in the BioFrontiers Institute. Today, I'm going to be sharing some of my recent research, in particular, how we've been using different kinds of light microscopy to study the spatiotemporal organization, dynamics, and function of virus replication centers during murine polyomavirus infection. Uh, because of the way the slides are laid out, I'm actually going to turn off my video for uh, most of the rest of the talk, but I will be with you um, live at the end of this to answer questions. The story I'm going to tell you today is based on data from these two papers. Much of the super resolution 3D SIM data is from this PLOS pathogens paper that we published in March. And the live cell microscopy data is from this paper, which was just accepted for a special issue of viruses. Um, and the special issue is focusing on the application of advanced imaging to the study of virus host interactions. I think the submission deadline is actually at the end of November. So maybe check it out on their website if you're interested. Um, I think it's going to be a pretty cool issue. So in addition to the data from these papers, I've sprinkled in just a, a few pieces of some additional data that are unpublished at this point. With that out of the way, I'll start with an outline of how the talk is organized um, to help kind of orient ourselves as we work our way through it. The first will be an introduction to polyomaviruses. Then uh, I'll tell you about my spatiotemporal analysis of polyomavirus replication centers in both wild type and mutant infections. Um, then I'll walk through some uh, general conclusions and uh, my working model and some future directions. I mentioned many of you have been thinking about viruses more in the past year than you probably ever have before, but I nonetheless want to orient you to kind of the diversity of different kinds of viruses and virus families. Viruses can be roughly organized by the material and polarity of their genomes, be they positive sense, single-stranded RNA um, viruses like coronaviruses and flaviviruses, or double-stranded DNA genomes like herpes viruses, papillomaviruses, and polyomaviruses, or really anything in between. Today I'll be talking exclusively about polyomaviruses, which as I mentioned a moment ago, have a double-stranded DNA genome. Before going into kind of the nitty gritty detail about these viruses, I wanna tell you a little bit more about them and why we think they're important. The first thing you need to know about polyomaviruses or PYVs is that they have a diverse host range. We've known for decades that members of the polyomavirus family can infect a number of different species, including birds, mice, rhesus macaque monkeys, and of course humans. These uh, viruses were discovered because of the diseases that they caused. But as researchers have started looking for polyomaviruses in other animals, they found them infecting many, many more species, such as uh, several sea lion species, 
See otters, dolphins, alpacas, tree shrews, and even giant pandas. More recently, analysis of DNA sequencing databases revealed polyomal virus-like sequences associated with several more mammalian, fish, and insect species. Together, this all points to long-standing co-evolution between animals and polyomal viruses. And to add another layer of complexity to all this, there are likely multiple polyomal viruses that infect each of these animals. And for an example of this, we just need to look at ourselves. There are 14 known human polyomal viruses that infect a diverse uh, range of cell types in the human body. Some human polyomal viruses are ubiquitous in the population, and the chances are pretty good that everyone listening to this has at least one polyomal virus in their system right now. We are um, likely exposed to these viruses during childhood, after which they cause asymptomatic persistent infections. Our immune systems work really hard to keep infections like these in check, but when the immune system is compromised in one way or the other, these very common human viruses can reactivate, so to speak, and cause very serious diseases. Okay, so now that we've covered some basic polyomavirus epidemiology, let me tell you a little bit about the virus itself. First of all, polyomavirus capsids are non-enveloped, meaning that this viral particle is what the cell binds in endocytosis at the start of infection. There isn't a lipid bilayer or a lipid layer surrounding the viral particle, as is the case for viruses like flus and coronaviruses. Within this protein shell is the viral genome, which is composed of about 5,300 base pairs of double-stranded DNA wrapped around 24 nucleosomes that are co-opted from the host during infection. The genome is organized into early and late regions. The early region expresses tumor or T antigen proteins, which we're going to talk a lot more about today. Um, these T antigen proteins permit and enhance infection. The late region expresses the structural capsid proteins, VP1, 2, and 3. And finally, viral genome replication and assembly of new viruses occurs in the host nucleus. So next, I want to put these processes of nuclear replication and virus assembly in the context of the whole viral life cycle. The virus first attaches to receptors on the cell's membrane, which triggers endocytosis. The virus traffics along microtubules to the endoplasmic reticulum where the virus um, is partially dismantled by ER resident proteins. The viral genome is then trafficked to the host nucleus. The viral T antigen proteins are expressed first, shown here in purple. One of these T antigen proteins called large T uh, or LT is translocated um, to the nucleus and directs viral DNA replication. When replication is underway, the structural proteins start being expressed, shown here in gold. They also translocate to the nucleus where viral assembly takes place. Eventually, the nucleus fills up with virus and the cell lyses, releasing progeny virus to go on and infect other cells. My work specifically focuses on the replication of viral DNA in the nucleus. So pretty much everything I'm going to show you is taking place in the nucleus. I want to provide a slightly more detailed model of viral DNA replication for you based on kind of what we know now. As the T antigen proteins are expressed, replication factors mediate the amplification of viral genomes, including cellular proteins like DNA polymerases and PCNA, as well as the viral large T antigen protein, which mediates viral replication and is absolutely required for infection. The DNA replication products are catenated or interlocking circular genomes. These genomes can't be packaged into viruses as they are, but cellular DNA damage response proteins, such as these, are recruited and mediate the resolution of discrete monomeric viral genomes, which can then be encapsidated by the late proteins VP1, 2, and 3. This process is relatively consistent between polyomaviruses um, but all the work I'm showing you today is from mouse or murine polyomavirus, which we use as a model for the family. Viral replication occurs within these subnuclear domains termed or called viral replication centers or VRCs, which are composed of cellular and viral proteins. We can visualize these structures using fluorescence microscopy. And on a grand scale, I'm interested in their, their organization and how it relates to infection. Here I'm showing the expansion of replication centers over time from discrete 
um, foci to large tracts by the end of infection by labeling uh, the large T antigen protein shown in red. My work has specifically focused on these viral replication centers or VRCs. I'm going to wrap up the introduction with a quick explanation of, of what these studies are going to talk about and um, why we answered these questions or um, investigated them. First of all, polyomaviruses are everywhere. They persistently infect humans as well as many other species. Viral replication centers are a critical aspect of the host pathogen interface uh, since viral and cellular proteins work together to accurately and efficiently replicate viral genomes. By enhancing our understanding of VRCs, we may better understand polyomavirus infections and diseases. So my overarching questions are, how are replication centers organized in space and time, and how can that organization teach us something about polyomavirus infection? So that wraps up the introduction portion of the talk, and now I'm going to tell you what we've learned about murine polyomavirus replication centers using live cell and super resolution microscopy techniques. So in the introduction, I showed you these images of polyomavirus replication centers, or VRCs, in fixed cells, and I indicated that VRCs have different appearances at different times post-infection. Um, they tend to look smaller and more focal early in infection, but if you look later, they tend to be more tract-like throughout the nucleus. These kind of base level observations suggested to us that VRCs probably change in size and shape and possibly number over time, but we really had no way to visualize VRCs in living cells. To complicate matters, murine polyomavirus infections are not synchronous, meaning that in a population of infected cells, some cells are further along in the infection cycle than others. This makes it really difficult to assess differences in replication centers in fixed cells. Um, whether you're looking at mutant viruses or drug treatments or whatever. To address this problem, my uh, colleague Kim Erickson and I generated a system that would allow us to visualize VRCs in living cells throughout infection. The goal was to investigate these arrows and the processes we thought they might represent, from VRC formation to their expansion and merging and eventually cell lysis and viral release. One of the cellular proteins that localizes to VRCs is called replication protein A, or RPA. RPA is a heterotrimer composed of 70, 32, and 14 kilodalton subunits that coats single-stranded DNA at replication forks and DNA breaks undergoing repair. We obtained a plasmid from Dr. Mark Wald at the University of Iowa that expresses a human RPA32 protein fused to a GFP. We generated a mouse fibroblast cell line that stably expresses this GFP tagged RPA32. Um, to make sure this transgenic and tagged protein was localizing as it was supposed to in our mouse cells, we did some characterization experiments, which you can read more about um, in the viruses paper. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'll just tell you that this GFP RPA construct relocalized to replication centers over time. It also relocalized to cellular DNA damage over time. Um, the cells were perfectly happy, they were infectable, and they produced virus. So this system really gave us a way to image VRCs in live cells for the first time. Here's a field of infected cells that were imaged from 20 to 50 hours post-infection at 10 minute intervals. All of the live cell data that I'll show you today was captured on and or 888 Ultra EMCCD. In this video clip, you'll see several exhibits, several of these cells exhibit nuclear foci that expand and merge over the course of infection before the cell eventually dies. One of the biggest challenges with these kind of data is how to analyze them and distill these observations into quantitative measurements. I'm going to let this play out again because I think it looks really cool. Uh, <laughs> so bear with me. Okay, so I created a MATLAB script that quantified GFP RPA32 relocalization over time in single cell vignettes like this. Uh, this is one uninfected cell and this is an infected cell. 
the script quantified a number of different characteristics, but um, the percent of signal in VRCs was the primary metric I used to quantify RPA relocalization. Basically, this metric reflects the relocalization of GFP RPA signal from the diffuse and dim nucleoplasm to dense and bright VRCs. Uninfected cells didn't exhibit any RPA relocalization over time, shown here in orange, um, whereas RPA in infected cells relocalized to VRCs. One of the, I mean, this was really exciting to get this system working and to have a way to analyze them. Um, so one of the first questions we wanted to investigate was how the multiplicity of infection or MOI affects VRC formation and expansion kinetics. For those who aren't familiar with the terminology, the MOI is basically a measure of how much virus was put on the cells during infection. We found that VRCs tended to form at earlier times post-infection when the uh, MOI was higher. So here's the percent of signal in VRCs on the y-axis and hours post-infection, HPI, on the x-axis. Um, individual traces of cells infected with high medium and low MOIs are shown in orange, violet, and blue, respectively. By 20 hours post-infection, we observed many of these high MOI cells with large VRCs, whereas many of these low, VR, or low MOI cells did not form replication centers until after 30 hours post-infection. We also found that there is a lot of variability between cells, as you can see here. Um, which is probably due to the asynchronicity of polyomavirus infections. To remove the effect of this variable, I aligned the individual traces of each cell to a threshold, 5%, shown here uh, by this dotted line, and found that the RPA relocalization kinetics were actually very consistent between cells during this linear phase, suggesting there are limiting factors that may dictate the rate of RPA relocalization, such as uh, the availability of viral DNA. We will revisit these live cell assays in a few minutes when we get to talking about the mutant viruses, but I wanna first dig a little bit deeper into how these VRCs are organized. In the process of collecting these live cell data, I took some short movies of infected cells at higher resolutions. Uh, these movies revealed that GFP RPA signal was not as uniformly distributed as it appeared at lower resolutions. In fact, we resolved several small RPA foci within these VRCs. This observation helped prompt a collaboration with Double Helix Optics, a startup company here in Boulder, using super resolution storm microscopy, and uh, this also used an Andor detector. Um, where we confirmed the presence of GFP RPA foci within replication centers. And this is one nucleus, and I'm showing um, a max intensity projection through the whole depth of the nucleus. And each of these little clusters is one of these RPA foci within a replication center like this. While this result was really exciting in and of itself, in a more general sense, it suggested that other VRC components may not be uniformly distributed. So in other words, there may be areas within VRCs where different components are concentrated. We've seen hints of this before using laser scanning confocal microscopy when imaging large T-antigen and other VRC components, in this case, phospho-ATM and activated uh, DNA damage response kinase in areas like this. These two proteins clearly occupy a similar space within the nucleus, but the overlap is imperfect at the replication center itself. There are regions where either protein is independent of or at least much brighter than the other. I wondered if these small spatial differences could represent functionally distinct VRC subdomains. I used another kind of super resolution microscopy called 3D structured illumination microscopy or 3D SIM to investigate this question. Before I show you what these images look like, I want to describe the experiment and how it's different from the data I've shown you so far. First of all, these are wild type cells, not the GFP RPA cells, and they're fixed, not alive. I've labeled these cells for endogenous RPA32, the viral large T antigen protein, 
and viral DNA by fluorescent in situ hybridization, or FISH, which labels all the viral genomes in the cell. This is what a typical infected cell looks like at this time point, and I've zoomed in um, on this one VRC. First, I saw these RPA foci, which was consistent with the results I showed you earlier from the transgenic cell line. Interestingly, the FISH signal overlapped viral DNA really well, uh, but large T antigen did not. And so really these results indicated that murine polyomavirus replication centers are organized into spatially distinct subdomains occupied by RPA32 and large T antigen. I'll be using these two proteins a lot throughout the talk to mark these distinct compartments within VRCs. Compartmentalization like this has been observed in other DNA viruses, but never polyomaviruses. So that was pretty exciting for us. To quantify the spatial relationships between points or between proteins in my 3D sim images, I used Pearson's correlation coefficients or PCCs. The PCC analysis measures how well the pixel intensities correlate between two fluorescent images. It is not a measure of spatial overlap like other colocalization metrics. Instead, PCCs measure co-occurrence. When a pixel is bright in channel one, how likely is it to be also bright in channel two? The basis for this kind of analysis is that spatial relationships imply functional relationships. So a perfect correlation of one would look like this. There's a perfect correlation at each pixel between the two fluorescence channels. A non-correlation of zero would look something like this. You can also imagine a perfect anti-correlation of negative one that typically indicates exclusion or repulsion of whatever's in your images. When it comes to analyzing fluorescence microscopy images this way, thresholding is a critical, critical step in isolating signal that you want to analyze. Thresholding is important because there are a lot of pixels, especially in these 3D sim images, that don't have any useful or real information in them. For my analyses, I use percentile-based intensity thresholds, which, <coughs> excuse me, I'll give an example of here. This is RPA32 signal from a single VRC. The white pixels are those that exceed the threshold um, denoted here, and the black pixels are those that do not exceed the threshold. The higher we set the threshold, the fewer dim background pixels are included in the analysis. I use this method for all the different fluorescence labels uh, in this study, but it was especially useful for separating two different subsets of RPA32 signal. Um, dim, dim RPA32 shown in blue here, and brighter focal RPA32 shown in red. Here are the results of PCC analysis for several nuclei um, in this experiment. Here I'm showing the average PCC values of large T antigen with each RPA32 subset. We found that large T antigen correlated best with dim RPA32, which is consistent with what we see by eye. We also found that fish labeled viral DNA correlated best with uh, focal RPA32, which is also consistent with what we see by eye. These results confirm spatially distinct subdomains um, are present and occupied by RPA32 and large T antigen. After identifying these distinct VRC subdomains, I analyzed the localization of other VRC components relative to RPA32 and large T antigen. There are many known VRC components, but I focused on DDR proteins for this study. The first protein is phospho-RPA32-S4S8 which preferentially associates with damaged DNA uh, rather than replication forks. PCC analysis indicated that phospho-RPA32 correlated best with focal RPA32, which was consistent with what we observed in these images. I repeated this process for three other DDR, DNA damage response proteins, phospho-ATM, gamma-H2AX, and MRE11, uh, which are all indicators of DDR signaling. They all correlated better with RPA than with large T antigen, and they each specifically correlated best with focal RPA32. 
indicating that viral DNA in this subdomain may be undergoing repair in these RPA foci. We hypothesized that if viral DNA in the focal RPA subdomain is undergoing repair, then viral DNA uh, may be synthesized near large T antigen. To answer this question, I used the thymidine analog EDU, which is incorporated into nascent DNA as it's being synthesized. EDU can be conjugated to fluorescent dyes using click chemistry, enabling the visualization of EDU labeled DNA. We knew from previous experiments that EDU labels nascent viral DNA within VRCs, like this cell that was pulsed with EDU for 30 minutes prior to being fixed. I adapted this principle to pulse chase experiments, where infected cells were given a much shorter EDU pulse, usually five minutes, then either fixed immediately or chased into EDU free media before being fixed at a later time point. In effect, the EDU pulse labels a discrete subpopulation of viral DNA, and we're imaging that subpopulation at different times post synthesis and in different cells. I did an EDU pulse chase experiment like this and labeled RPA32 and large T antigen, and I found that nascent EDU labeled viral DNA overlapped very well with large T antigen. In the chase conditions, however, EDU labeled viral DNA appeared to dissociate from large T antigen and relocalize to, R <laughs> relocalize to RPA32. PCC analysis confirmed the progressive relocalization of EDU labeled viral DNA from large T antigen, oops, large T antigen to focal RPA32. These results indicated that large T antigen and focal RPA32 subdomains are spatially and functionally distinct. So just to kind of bring this all together to some conclusions about the wild type replication centers, uh, we generated stable cell lines expressing a GFP RPA32 and visualized VRC dynamics over time using live cell fluorescence microscopy. We found that RPA relocalization kinetics were consistent between cells despite the asynchronicity of formation, suggesting there may be limiting factors that dictate the rate of RPA relocalization, and that's something we're looking into currently. RPA32 and large T antigen are organized into spatially and functionally distinct subdomains, and replication associated subdomain that we found uh, was occupied by large T antigen and nascent viral DNA, and there was a repair associated subdomain occupied by focal RPA32, DDR proteins, and chased viral DNA. So, to bring this back to this model of polyomavirus genome. Uh, replication, my results indicated that these processes, viral DNA replication and uh, genome resolution, are likely occurring in separate VRC subdomains. The first may be occupied by these replication associated proteins and nascent viral DNA, and the second occupied by these DNA repair associated proteins that can resolve viral DNA intermediates into monomeric packageable genomes. All of the experiments in this section were done using wild type virus, but I'm gonna next share what we learned about how the viral T antigen proteins contribute to viral DNA replication by studying mutant viruses. To study the roles of individual T antigen proteins, I used mutant murine polyomaviruses called 808A and NG18, which lack expression of one or more T antigen protein. As I mentioned way back in the introduction, Murine polyomaviruses express three T antigen proteins, large T, middle T, and small T. The 808A virus only expresses large T and small T, and the NG18 virus only expresses large T antigen. By subtraction, any difference between uh, 808A and NG18 can be attributed to the activity of small T antigen. Early work from the 1980s with these viruses indicated that NG18 infections only replicate about 10% as much viral DNA as wild type or a to a a infections, indicating small t contributes to efficient viral DNA replication. I repeated a similar experiment using qPCR and got pretty similar results when a previous graduate student, Katie Heiser, visualized 
viral replication centers. During each of these infections, she found that NG18 VRCs were always smaller than wild type or A to 8A VRCs. Combined, these results suggest that VRC morphology or size depends on the degree of viral DNA replication. It's unclear from these experiments, though, how exactly replication centers are different during NG18 infection and how small T antigen contributes to viral DNA replication. Before I tell you what I've done to help answer these questions, I first want to tell you what we know about small t. The characteristic function of small t is the modulation of protein phosphatase 2A, or PP2A. PP2A is an important regulator of the cell cycle and the DNA damage response by regulating protein phosphorylation. PP2A typically exists as a heterotrimer. There's an A scaffold subunit, a C catalytic subunit, and a B regulatory subunit. Small t mimics a B regulatory subunit, directing PP2A activity towards some substrates and away from others. To understand how small t relates to VRCs and VRC expansion, I analyzed these mutant murine polyomaviruses uh, using live cell microscopy of GFP RPA32 cells. So just to refresh, this is what a wild type inf infected cell looks like. You'll see VRCs form and expand until the cell eventually dies. 808A infected cells look similar um, to wild type, but NG18 VRCs don't appear to expand after they form. I quantified these data in the same way I showed you earlier by quantifying the percent of signal in VRCs over time. I found that wild type and 808A were very similar on average, but NG18 was significantly different. Another mutant, NG59, shown in violet, uh, was similar to NG18, and it also only expresses large T antigen. To get a better understanding of how the NG18 VRCs were different, I quantified other characteristics that could result in this defect. I'm not going to show the data for this point in particular because it wasn't very interesting, but I quantified the number of replication centers in each cell at this threshold. And there was no difference between conditions. Each virus had about 20 replication centers per cell, plus or minus about six. However, we did find that the percentage of nuclear area occupied by replication centers was lower in NG18 and NG59 infected cells, indicating that small t is required for VRC expansion. Furthermore, we found that the average density of GFP signal within replication centers tended to be lower in NG18 and NG59 infected cells, suggesting those VRCs may harbor less viral DNA than wild type or a to 8 a VRCs. These results were consistent with previous studies showing mutants lacking small t replicate far less viral DNA during infection. We believe this live cell microscopy system recapitulated those results and opens the door for more temporal um, studies showing mutants, or sorry, more temporal analyses using other live cell markers in combination. For the rest of the talk though, um, I'm gonna be switching back to the super resolution 3D SIM images of fixed cells. So far I've shown you that NG18 does not replicate viral DNA very well and NG18 VRCs don't expand very much after forming. I next analyzed how small T antigen contributes to viral DNA re relocalization. Uh, similar to wild type, NG18 VRCs exhibited organization of focal RPA32 and large T antigen into distinct subdomains. And nascent EDU labeled viral DNA overlapped with large T antigen. In the pulse chase conditions, however, I did not observe the same level of viral DNA relocalization as we observed in wild type VRCs. Here's the PCC analysis of NG18 infected cells in orange compared to wild type infected cells in gray. It indicated large T and NG18 viral DNA did not dissociate as much over the 60 minute chase. And viral DNA relocalization to focal RPA32 was delayed in NG18 infected cells. These results indicated that small t is required for efficient viral DNA relocalization after synthesis. I also calculated the PCC values
for large T antigen and RPA32 subsets in NG18 infected cells. Compared to wild type, I detected a significant increase in the correlation of large T and dim RPA32. This implies there's more RPA at NG18 viral DNA replication forks, which is a hallmark of replication stress. This result hinted that small t may contribute to viral DNA, sorry, to VRC organization. To test this idea, I localized the same DDR proteins as I showed earlier, phospho-RPA, uh, phospho-ATM, gamma-H2AX, and MRA11 during NG18 infection, and compared the results to wild-type VRCs. In wild-type VRCs, these proteins all preferentially correlated with the focal RPA32 subdomain. But in NG18 VRCs, hyperphosphorylated RPA32 exhibited reversed correlations. It correlated worse with focal RPA32 and much better with large T antigen. Phospho-ATM, the DDR kinase, shifted slightly away from focal RPA32, but unexpectedly, I also observed regions of VRC-adjacent labeling that were not present in wild-type infection. Gamma H2AX, the damage-associated histone, only shifted localization very modestly within VRCs, but I again observed regions of VRC-adjacent signal. MRE11, the component of the MRN complex that detects double-stranded DNA breaks, was the only protein that didn't change localization between viruses. These data indicate uh, that small T antigen contributes to viral replication center organization, and that DDR signaling may be different between wild type and NG18 infections. All right, so our takeaways from this mutant analysis section. First of all, RPA relocalization rate in wild type and 808A VRCs were the same. Um, viral DNA relocalization in wild type and 808A VRCs was also the same. Small T antigen contributes to VRC expansion, viral DNA relocalization, and VRC organization. NG18 VRCs did not expand after formation in the GFP RPA cells. NG18 viral DNA also did not efficiently relocalize from large T to RPA32 subdomains. Some DDR proteins were localized differently in the NG18 infected cells. So I'm going to talk about uh, what these results mean in a minute. Um, so I'm going to talk through these overall conclusions, my working model, and finally some future directions. I want these conclusions to be the big picture takeaways from this presentation. Um, first of all, polyomavirus replication centers are dynamic and complex nuclear domains. Live cell microscopy allowed us to study how these replication centers change over time in single cells. Super resolution microscopy resolved the compartmentalization of VRC components into subdomains that were spatially and functionally distinct. Small t antigen is critical for the accurate and efficient replication of polyomavirus genomes. We showed by live cell microscopy uh, that NG18 VRCs do not expand after formation, and super resolution microscopy exposed differences in viral DNA re relocalization after synthesis and the organization of DDR proteins within NG18 VRCs. Finally, image analysis can yield more information from fluorescence microscopy images than our eyes can alone. So I want to bring us back to this model one more time. My results indicated that viral DNA replication and genome resolution are likely occurring in separate subdomains within VRCs. My results also indicated that small t antigen contributes to the spatial and temporal organization of these processes. But how exactly might that be? Here is my current working model. In polyomavirus replication centers, there are many phosphorylated proteins, including those I've shown images of today. The phosphorylation states of these proteins dictate their function in DNA replication and repair. This phosphorylation state is in turn regulated by cellular phosphatases like PP2A. In wild type infection, small t could be targeting PP2A phosphatase activity in such a way that permits robust and accurate replication of monomeric viral genomes. In infections lacking small t, however, the endogenous PP2A activity could be targeted differently, resulting in a different set of phosphoproteins 
and reduced viral DNA accumulation. My results showed that these phosphoproteins are still present in the absence of small t, but their relocalization indicates DDR signaling is also different. I'll be investigating this model in more depth um, currently, actually. All right, that leads us to the future directions. These are some questions that have stemmed from the work I showed you today, and they're things that are currently being investigated in the lab. First of all, how do genetic and chemical perturbations affect VRC composition, organization, and function? In other words, how can we interrupt these processes of viral DNA replication and genome resolution, and how does that affect replication centers uh, in a way that we can observe by microscopy? We've done a little bit of this with hydroxyurea, which depletes DNTPs and inhibits um, replication, it stalls replication forks, and we found that it pretty dramatically changes the way replication centers look. Uh, and this work is shown in the PLOS Pathogens paper, uh, but I didn't have time to show it today. Are there other VRC subdomains? So I showed you a replication associated subdomain and a repair associated subdomain, but we think there may also be a subdomain associated with viral gene transcription, where transcription machinery um, localizes, as well as uh, viral genome chromatization. So the viral DNA has to uh, be chromatinized by the host's nucleosomes prior to encapsidation. And there's a lot of cellular machinery that's involved in that process, and we think there may be a subdomain associated with it. Where does viral DNA localize after RPA foci? So the EDU pulse chase experiments I showed you today only went as far as these this um, genome resolution step, we think. Uh, we don't know at this point where viral DNA localizes after it leaves RPA foci. So we're working on pushing that pulse chase experiment further down the pipeline to see where viral DNA localizes and with what proteins um, it associates. What else can we learn about VRC subdomains from microscopy? Uh, all of the information I showed you today is based on kind of nuclear, like whole nucleus uh, analysis. And I'm interested in building new tools to um, improve the resolution of our analysis. And finally, what other proteins are associated with replication centers during infection? So I showed you a handful of proteins today uh, there are many more associated with replication centers, and it'll be interesting to see which ones associate with viral DNA at different times post-synthesis. And um, we're also using a biochemical technique called IPOND to identify um, proteins associated with replication centers that we didn't even know were there. So kind of building a roadmap for how this whole process works. Uh, to touch on one of those points really quickly, I just want to talk about how we're um, working on improving the resolution of image analysis. So as I just said, previous analyses of all the live cell and super resolution images are based on whole nuclei. And a new tool that is in development currently will hopefully let us dig deeper by automatically identifying and analyzing individual replication centers within cells. This has been a technically challenging aspect of image analysis because, um, as I've shown you today, these replication centers are uh, very dynamic. They sometimes are very close to each other. They grow, they expand, they merge, they really change over time. And so um, building a tool to automatically identify them in all their diversity in space and time uh, has been challenging, but we're hoping that um, by analyzing them individually, we can increase the granularity of the information we get from these microscopy data. Um, each replication center can be analyzed individually to quantify the co-localization of different proteins, the relative volume of different uh, subdomains, intensity correlations, things like that. Um, so that's kind of an exciting thing that I, I've been working on. Um, yeah. Uh, so just a big thank you to all of you for listening. Um, this is a really fun opportunity to share my research with such a big and global group of people. Thank you to Andor for setting it up and LabRoots for uh, hosting it. Thank you to the Garcia Lab for everything. Um, the two light microscopy core facilities where I do all of this work 
Uh, they're run by Dr. James Orth and Dr. Joe Dragovan, and um, they really keep these microscopes up and running and in good condition. Uh, this work is all supported by NIH grants, and uh, with that, I would be happy to take questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Doug. Hello, I am Dr. Alan Mullen, Product Specialist for Microscopy Cameras at Andor Technology, and in the last couple of slides of this presentation, I wanted to briefly outline some of the imaging solutions that Andor provide for virology experiments. This covers a range of high sensitivity cameras, confocal systems which combine multiple imaging techniques within the one system, and of course we also have the Amara software which is a powerful tool for visualization and analysis. Um, but I really just want to focus on the camera side um, of this. As we know, fluorescence microscopy is a really powerful technique across all of uh, cell bi biology applications. But for virology, it's, it's much more difficult. Viruses, of course, are much smaller, which causes a lot of problems since they are well below the limit of diffraction, uh, making light microscopy very difficult to see what's just going on beneath that resolution limit. Uh, size also can make it quite difficult in terms of effective labeling of those components of the virus capsid and, and so on. And lastly, of course, we have a sort of a background or a context of biosafety of how we handle whatever virus or model that we're working with. But uh, thankfully, there's a range of microscopy techniques which have really allowed us to progress fluorescence microscopy for gaining further insight into the virus infectious cycle and understanding more about the virus and host cell interactions as Doug has uh, described earlier. So different techniques, of course, will have their different advantages. Um, techniques like TERF are very useful for studying events in high resolution, but only in a, in a, in a small depth of less than 100 nanometers, making it effective for events close to the cell membrane. 3D SIM, as Doug has described, along with other super resolution techniques such as STORM and PAM, allow much improved resolution. So it allows us to get a much better idea of how components of the virus, labeled components of the virus and of the host cells are localized together during the infectious cycle. Also as part of this, um, beyond the techniques, there's been developments in labeling strategies of how we label viruses um, and including genetically encoded dyes and then also um, not quite so much but uh, also quantum dots as well as an alternative strategy. And really dr driving or really helping to allow everything to go ahead. Um, we need to have high sensitivity detectors and we see EMCCD and SCMOS cameras playing a role in this. And on the right hand side we can see an example of SIM imaging compared to wide field above and you can see an improvement in resolution um, between those two methods. For typical cell imaging applications and also for say some high throughput PCR based um, screening, we can use SCMOS cameras because these are very fast, uh, sensitive for what we need them to do and also allow us to have a very wide field of view. But whenever we start looking at experiments where we're trying to look at individual virus particles and how they interact with um, intracellular structures and features within the cell, for example, the signals involved are inherently very weak, so we need to get the most sensitive detector that we can. 
And the most sensitive cameras that we have available are what's called EMCCD technology cameras. And what's important in these is that they have electron multiplication um, circuitry within them and it's unique to this kind of uh, camera and this allows them to boost the incoming signal many fold so that it, before the camera reads out it is much higher than the background level so even for small numbers of photons very low levels of light these cameras are still effective whereas the SCMOS camera is above here as you can see in the upper image, that you can't see any signal at all. So for that reason, they're widely used still in signal molecule physics applications, and of course also for uh, virology and the uh, wider microbiology of bacteria as well. Um, and in terms of these cameras, it has been the Exxon EMCCD cameras that for many years have been used. And over the time, these have been refined, reaching the current models, which there's an Exxon Ultra model, which is the most sensitive EMCCD camera available. And then there is also an Exxon Life camera, which allows people to use EMCCD technology at a lower price point, because obviously this exclusive technology costs more than an SCMOS camera would typically do. Some of the main points about the Exxon EM CCD cameras are about this, um, the sensitivity that they can provide, which is achieved through 95% quantum efficiency, which means that 95% uh, of the photons which hits that, hit that sensor are converted into an electronic signal and of course the EM gain uh, that's unique to these cameras that I mentioned. Um, the Exxon cameras are also deep cooled to minus 100 degrees C so this means that you can achieve the lowest possible noise and the sensors are enclosed in a permanent vacuum seal for reliability and to allow that deep cooling without issues to do with condensation. There's a range of sensor models in both the ultra and the lower cost life ranges and these are really to do with the sizes of the sensors um, that you can have so the full details on those specifications are available on the um, specification sheet. If we look at how the exon has been used in virology experiments, we can break this down by really an A to Z of viruses and we can see that this ties in with the clinical significance of these viruses. So it would be the usual suspects of things such as HIV, um, influenza A, um, hepatitis C and more recently we can of course uh, we can see coronavirus um, as well appearing um, in the last number of years and by application type as well we can see the types of application or technique rather that it has been used in so as we talked about single molecule localization based super resolution sim as uh, Doug has described here um, earlier, and turf and uh, normal confocal as well, with a few other techniques um, starting to creep in as well. And finally, we can also look at what aspect of the virus infectious cycle has been studied with these cameras, and we can see this covers all of the events of the uh, virus cycle uh, as well as um, the development of antiviral drug treatments and vaccines um, as well. In the last number of years, we have seen a new generation of SCMOS cameras called uh, back-illuminated SCMOS. And um, what these do is these build upon the strengths of SCMOS cameras, which is its high speed and large fields of view. And they do this by boosting that quantum efficiency. So they're more efficient at converting the signals into uh, an electrical signal. And an example of this would be our and or Sona SCMOS cameras range. So um, if we briefly compare these, 
if we look at this signal to noise ratio plot and we can compare how well these cameras do at different amounts of light in terms of photons per pixel and signal to noise with a better signal to noise ratio uh, giving better performance. We can see that this EMCCD trace is down here. So at the very lowest end of the scale, we can see that EMCCD is providing a better signal to noise ratio and is therefore more suitable for applications within that area. And then if we look at the back illuminated SCMOS cameras, their profile is, is higher up. So we can still see that where we see virology studies uh, typically being situated, the EMCCD cameras would still overall be the uh, option to choose. However, back illuminated SCMOS cameras, you do see some overlap potentially for those. So if we have enough signal, we can take advantage of those faster SCMOS cameras and the wider fields of view so we can see more of a sample and more of what's happening within the cell. Um, so that means that the, it is a possible alternative to consider. However, for these most challenging applications where we're looking at live uh, virus tracking studies and looking at high magnification, and uh, very low signals, it still remains that these EMCCD cameras like the Exxon, which would be the detectors of choice. Perhaps one of the downsides of super resolution techniques is the highly specialized requirements that some of them have. So you can end up with having some quite complex setups. Um, so just to point out an alternative solution that can suit some people is through using a technique called SURF. And this allows you to boost the resolution on a normal microscope in a number of modalities, such as wide field or turf, simply by using this approach. And this approach is, uh, SURF, as I mentioned, is based on radio fluctuations that occur within fluorophores. And by using GPU, based processing over a number of very short exposure frames of your image, you can build up spatial and temporal information about the fluctuations of those fluorophores and then localize that um, to allow for a much higher resolution. And for using this technique that you can achieve between 100 and 120 nanometers of resolution. So probably equivalent to what you would get from SIM and this can be using normal fluorophores and crucially can use low illumination intensities. And this technique has been used for many uh, studies looking at the intracellular trafficking and the effects of localization of uh, components within, the, within cells. And uh, a variation of this is called SurfStream Plus, which is an, op is an optimized real-time version of the SURF principle. And that is uh, an option that's available exclusively through Andor technology and is available on selected Andor cameras. So if you want to find out a bit more about the products covered and some of the other ones that we didn't get time to, please go to the Andor website to find out more. There's a lot of other more educational information on there, uh, which looks at a range of different things, such as the different types of techniques that are used for virology studies and how the different uh, techniques provide advantages for looking at different aspects of the virus cycle. And lastly, thanks very much to Doug for the presentation today and for everybody for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peters and Dr. Mullen for your informative presentations. So we will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar and we will answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started with our first one. Um, Dr. Peters, it looks like this one is for you, and it is a two-part question. What is the earliest time post-infection that you have followed the VRCs? And the second part is, 
what is the homology between RPA human and mouse? And you use the human, correct? Yeah, uh, those are good questions. Um, so as far as how early we've imaged them, uh, I have imaged them as early as two hours post-infection and imaged them out uh, a couple of days on the spinning disc confocal, actually. Uh, typically, we don't see replication centers forming until um, kind of mid 20-ish hours post-infection. But as I showed uh, during the talk, at higher MOIs, we can push that up. And sometimes we see cells like 12 hours post-infection that have replication centers already. Um, for the second part of the question, yes, we did use the human. I think um, the amino acid percent identity for RPA32 is something around 90%. Um, so they're pretty highly related. The DNA binding domain is uh, pretty much identical and all of the phosphorylation sites uh, on the end terminus of RPA32 are also uh, the same. Wonderful. That looks like we have time for one more question. So we'll move on to our last one. Uh, great talk, Dr. Peters. You showed that there's a transition from catenated circular vDNA that is decatenated prior to following steps of the viral cycle. Can you please give some further insight about this step of transition and what is known about the requirement of decantination? Also, if there also is the decantination step really upstream, for, uh, really upstream, excuse me, from chromatinization. Yeah, those are good questions. Uh, so the decatenation step, um, from what I recall. So these, these DNA, damage uh, DNA damage response proteins kind of help m mediate the uh, Cairns intermediate that forms um, on the opposite end of the, of the viral genome from the origin of replication. Uh, and this resolution step is thought to be um, required for packaging of, of discrete viral genomes. Um, I know that I'm trying to think of a way to answer the second part of the question. So there are there are situations where you get rolling circle replication of the viral genome instead of um, these catenated viral genomes, and those cannot be packaged. Um, but as far as an inhibitor that or some sort of perturbation that affects the actual resolution, I, I haven't heard of it, but that's that would be an interesting thing to pursue. And is this step upstream from chromatization? Um, that is also something that we're looking into. We, we don't know when these viral genomes are chromatinized. Uh, it would be really interesting to see where that machinery localizes. And that's actually something um, that we've been talking about doing. So, uh, yeah, I think those are really good questions and, and stuff that we're looking forward to investigating soon. Wonderful. Thank you again, Dr. Peters and Dr. Mullen. Um, do either Thank of you, you have final comments for our audience? Um, thank you all for listening, and I will uh, try to answer some of these questions um, after this, and I'll, I'll reach out and contact you. Yep, that's it. Uh, thanks to everybody for listening today, and we'll try and get back to anybody who answered us or asked us any questions that we haven't been able to get time to answer. Thank you. Wonderful. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. I know we didn't have a ton of time, but as our speaker said, questions that we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. We would like to once again thank Dr. Peters and Dr. Mullen for their, for their time today and their important research. We would also like to thank Labroots and our sponsor, Andor, for underwriting today's educational webcast. You can view the webinar on demand. Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again next time. Bye-bye.